There are two reasons that shape the overall character of a human being, especially during the crucial stages of childhood. The first is how our biological predispositions shape how we react to our environment and how it reacts to us. And the second is how our interactions with our environment shape the structural and organizational characteristics of our brains, otherwise known as nature versus nurture. What I wanna explore is how and what researchers have discovered regarding what we know about a child's true biological moral intentions, or in layman's terms, is a child born good or evil? So what does it mean to be evil? According to Irvin Staub in his book, The Psychology of Good and Evil, Why Children, Adults, and Groups Help and Harm Others, evil means human destructiveness. This can be fairly obvious, such as violent acts against others or even genocide, or it can come in smaller ways or persistent harm doing, such as child abuse and bullying. Such actions can deflate a child's spirit, self-esteem, and even ability to trust others. Oftentimes, intense violence, destructive as it is, doesn't always mean it's evil. It could just be a justified self-defense mechanism in response to an unjustified attack on oneself, one's family, or one's peer group. A perfect example of this would be the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on 9-11. In the attacker's eyes, their perception of their action towards our nation were in defense of their God and religious and moral beliefs. They didn't see it as bad. But as the USA, we reacted in defense of our people by going to war. In author Paul Bloom's book, Just Babies, The Origins of Good and Evil, most people are born with natural endowments, or blessings if you will. These endowments include a moral sense, or some capacity to distinguish between kind and cruel actions, empathy and compassion, or being able to witness suffering at the pain of those around us and wishing to make this pain go away, a rudimentary sense of fairness, or a tendency to favor equal divisions of resources, and a rudimentary sense of justice, a desire to see good actions rewarded and bad actions punished. Although it is quite difficult to explore the cognitive capabilities of a young child, luckily researchers were able to capture one solid qualitative research assessment on one of those four endowments listed the rudimentary sense of justice. An experiment illustrated in Bloom's book documented the phenomenon through a simple manipulated puppet show given to several five-month-old babies, where in the show, three puppets participated in trivial acts such as tossing a ball, putting each other in a box, and so on. While one of the puppets was good and demonstrated cooperative skills, such as kindly passing the ball back to the other puppets or helping the other puppets out of the box, the quote-unquote evil puppet managed to display acts such as running away with the ball and shoving the other puppets in the box. After the puppet show, researchers placed treats in front of the puppets and observed which treat the child would reach for. And in nearly all cases, the children reached toward the evil puppet's treat and then proceeded to smack the puppet on the head in a bad, bad puppet gesture. This created a generous platform for researchers to base that some aspects of morality come naturally to us and others do not. It suggests that babies at this age can have a general appreciation of good and bad behavior. Although it doesn't necessarily determine if said child will have impulses to good and avoid evil later on in life, it does demonstrate a suggestion of possibility that children are in fact born with a sense of moral judgment more often than not. Having a sense of good can be biological in response to evolutionary modeling. For example, the genes of parents who care for their children are more likely to spread through the population than those parents who abandoned or ate their children. Another evolutionary standpoint could be from our earliest ancestors in regards to other people outside of immediate family. For example, working together in hunting, gathering, childcare, and so on was a big factor. So if most signs point to children being born inherently good, then what is it that makes a child evil? The answer to this question can be found generally in two areas, fear or psychopathic behavior. In terms of fear, besides the evolutionary instincts instilled in us to protect us from harm and fulfill our survival instincts, more often than not, it is a conditioned factor from learned traits acquired from parentals. In today's modern society, Media does a terrific job at infiltrating fear in our people. 
A perfect example of this would be from a video clip I found in John Oliver's HBO series, Migrants and Refugees. In this clip, it illustrates how video footage of several Muslims on a train reciting religious chants made its way onto national news coverage. To any viewer tuning in, it would immediately create a perceived sense of danger that refugee terrorists were on their way to hurt us. What most people don't know, however, is that the video was created in 2010, years before it made its way onto Fox News Live, and thus being irrelevant to the current crisis at hand and only creating potentially irreversible fear among viewers. With these random events slipping into the media and spreading its fear-instilling web across the nation, it ultimately creates panic among adults and parents, which, in turn, directly affects the children residing in the households who will then be influenced and potentially brainwashed by the reactions of the parents. A perfect nurture factor, if you will. Since it is in humanity's natural instinct to help and rescue others, the only way our government could secure the detachment of this emotional instinct is to instill a fear of safety of our country and in order to do so, must create ways in which these refugees and immigrants coming here could potentially cause severe damage and threat. Children catch on to this and mirror their guardian figures in this fear, leading to further lack of understanding of what is really worth fearing and being protective of oneself over. When one commits a moral violation, such as, for random example, shoving a poor old person, it connects to certain emotions and desires. This particular example should, unless you are a psychopath, create some sort of anger towards the attacker and sympathy towards the victim. However, there are citizens who walk among us that don't have this ability, psychopaths. And according to psychologists at the University College of London who conducted two studies on child mental disorders, it was affirmed that one in 100 kids have psychopathic tendencies. These kids, which psychologists describe as callous and unemotional, are characterized by their ability to lie, manipulate, and commit acts of cruelty without remorse. Therefore, in connection to our Lord of the Flies viewing done from one of our units, there is a heavy chance that one of the children involved in the terrorizing and slaughtering behavior demonstrated in the film obtained this trait and merely influenced the following of suit from others in that abandoned island situation. But there's good news. Research has shown that young brains are highly plastic, so even if a child has a particular neurological structure, he may not have it as an adult. In fact, several studies indicate that not all children who have callous unemotional traits become adult psychopaths, especially if they're exposed to the right treatments and proper nurture at a young enough age.